we come to you, Lord, this morning in the name of Jesus, so that, O oh, Father, each one of us, the ones behind the pulpit, the ones in the front, the ones in the back, all of us will know, Father, this is about you, this is about your kingdom. Not about any one of us. People haven't been given authority to judge. I pray, Father, people will not judge. But where people have been given authority to judge, I also pray they will have the courage to stand up and speak. But speak in manners in which your word demands and not the flesh demands. So that our Father together has the body, we will move forward to the destiny that you have set for us, each one of us. And today even as we look into your word, the word you have been speaking to us, to me and to them, first to me and then to them. Father, I pray the word will continue to work in each one of us. Each one of us. For oh, Father, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's quickly turn to the gospel according to John. Chapter 10, verse 32 onwards. Oh, sorry, chapter 11 and verse 32 onwards. We are hearing. We saw Mary and Martha and now... Then Mary came where Jesus was. Mary was sent for and she came, saw him, she fell down at his feet saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. He said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. And the shortest words in the Bible for those who will have quiz questions during youth meetings, Jesus wept. Luke 11, 35. Then Jews said, see how he loved him. Why are you reading it all in detail? You will see in a crowd there are many opinions. Many people have many things to say. All of that is not true. All of that not is true. They will also have comments. And some of them said, could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept this man from dying? You know about whom they are speaking? In every crowd there are people who will have many opinions about how things should be done. But Jesus doesn't go by that. His ways don't fit. He will might wait till somebody is dead and buried for four days. Then Jesus again groaning himself came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. And Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha the sister of him who was dead said to him, Lord, by this time there is a stench for he has been dead four days. And Jesus said to her, Mark verse 40 in your Bible. Your entire walk with God works on verse 40. Jesus said to her, Did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And I know that you always hear me. But because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. Now when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to him, Loose him and let him go. We'll stop there. And Jesus said in John 11, 40, If you, if you, if you, you will, that's not what the way we have been taught. We have been taught that if you see, you will believe. Everything that you do in your classroom is connected with seeing and believing. Everything that you do in every classroom, whether it is science or physics or chemistry or maths or whatever it is, if you see, I will believe. But God says the kingdom of God doesn't operate that way. If you believe, I will see. That's where faith begins. That's what faith is. What is faith? I see because I believe. Not that I believe because I see. That's what faith. And scripture says in Hebrews 11 and verse 6, without faith, it is impossible to please God. It is impossible to please God because without faith, it is impossible to please Him. For he who comes to God must believe that He is. That He is. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. And you need to realize, before you can even start your walk of faith, start your walk of faith, you need to go to where it's first mentioned in terms of an individual, Hebrews 11 and verse 3. 
Verse 4. By faith, who is the first person mentioned? Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts. Though he is dead, he still, he still speaks. The first thing when you see connected with a man who is accounted for his faith is an altar. You don't have an altar, you cannot have a sacrifice. An altar, a sacrifice, a fire. These three things will only make the entire ceremony complete. Are you getting it? You need to believe, you need to have an altar. How do you know you have believed because you have an altar? How do you know you have not believed because there is no altar? You check the people in the Old Testament, you will see the ones who fell away never built an altar in their lives. Is, is, is altar mentioned with Saul? It's not mentioned with Saul. Is altar mentioned with Abraham? Is mentioned with Isaac? Is mentioned with, with Jacob? Is mentioned with Elijah? All the men of God, there was always an altar because without an altar, how will you sacrifice? Because faith will always demand that you sacrifice something. Like the question dear brother asked yesterday, what did it cost you to follow Jesus? What did it cost you to follow Jesus? Have you ever asked? No, it didn't cost me anything. That's because you haven't followed him. You haven't walked by faith. Because if you walk by faith, there is an altar and there is a sacrifice. There is a price to be paid. There will always be a price to be paid. What did it cost you to follow Jesus? There is an altar. There is a sacrifice. Because without faith, it is impossible to please God. All your works are pointless and meaningless. You can be the best in the flesh, but in faith the only thing God looks is, do you have an altar? Do you have a sacrifice? If the altar and the sacrifice is there, he says, then the fire will fall. How did, after I have asked this question, how did Cain know God accepted Abel's sacrifice? How did, is it written there? It's written Cain was angry. It's written Cain was angry. It is not written why Cain was angry. How did Cain know that Abel's sacrifice was accepted and his was rejected? You have to read the rest of scripture. Whenever God accepted a sacrifice, fire came down from above. So Abel and Cain with came with sacrifices and the fire fell on Abel's and Cain's was left like black. Why? Because the altar always talks about consecration. Abel was consecrated to God's word. Cain was consecrated to his understanding of what should be given to God. Sometimes we come with great understanding of what I need to give God. And we realize, why have I left the church without feeling anything? I don't feel the fire of God at all. Because God doesn't want you to come with understanding. God wants you to come with faith. And faith will cost you. Cost, faith will always cost you. And Abel came by faith. In the eyes of understanding, his offering looked terrible. In the eyes of understanding, Cain's offering looked wonderful. But God doesn't look the way we look at things. He doesn't look at the way we look at things. He looks at things differently. And even today when we have come to the house of the Lord, he is asking, Is there faith? Is there an altar in your life? Is there a sacrifice in your life? Then fire will fall. Salvation is free. So there was an altar prepared for the Son of God and there was a fire that fell upon him on. You remember he says there is a baptism that I need to undergo. That was the fire that he went through, the sacrifice he went through. Salvation is free, you and I did not. But post salvation God says where is your altar? Where is your consecration? Where is your sacrifice? You need to realize because they had an altar and they had a sacrifice when their brother was ill, they could send word to Jesus. That was the reason. They could send word to Jesus and Jesus visited them. Did you get on your knees and seek him? Did you search the scriptures before you gave out? Or gave anything? Did you pray before counseling? Where is the altar? Did you seek God first? Did you seek God's ways first? That's where you come to the altar, because at the altar a death has to take place. In the new covenant, the death is the death of your own self. 
of your own opinions, of your own ideas, your own understanding, your own ways, your own flesh, you come and say, Lord, I offer myself as a living sacrifice. You tell me what should I do. And you do that honestly from your heart, you will see the fire of God fall. And that fire is needed for then the rest of the work to that is to follow. And then, everyone in the Bible who went to Jesus received a miracle. They had to go in faith. Do you know that? Everyone who went to Jesus received a miracle. There were skeptics, they didn't receive anything. There were doubters who didn't receive anything. But those who went by faith, whether it was a centurion or whether it was a Samaritan woman or whether it was a Canaanite woman, they received because they went by faith. Because there was an altar where they came to the end of themselves and said, Lord, this is what I believe. What is that the Roman centurion saw in Jesus? Have you ever asked? What did the Roman centurion see in Jesus to believe him? You have to read scripture very carefully. Luke chapter 7. One word is the clue. And when he concluded all these things in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. A certain centurion servant who was dear to him was sick and ready to die. So when he heard about Jesus, he sent elders of the Jews to him, pleading with him to come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they begged him earnestly, saying that, the one for whom he should do this was deserving. For he loves some nation and has built us a synagogue. When Jesus went with them, and then Jesus went with them. And when he was already not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof. Therefore I did not even think myself worthy to come to you. But say the word and my servant will be healed. For? For? What is the word stress on there? No, also. Where is that? I? I have recognized you, Jesus, that you are a man under authority. And I recognize that I am also a man under authority. Therefore, I know it will work. That is how miracles work in God's kingdom. That's the key. He says, I also am a man under authority. I understand. You may be the son of God, but you are under authority. You are, you are not operating on your own. You are under authority. In the picture, that's how faith works. That's how miracle works. Because it is written, therefore it shall be. Because it is written, that is what I am going to do. Because I am coming under the authority of the written word of God. He has spoken and he has said, I have exalted my word above the heavens. It cannot change. And you and I do not have the liberty to change it. That's how faith operates. That is when you say, I consecrate myself to this word. Then after that it doesn't matter. Whatever happens, God says, I know he is under authority. He listens to my word. He listens to my word. He doesn't raise his opinions above my word. I can speak to him. I can talk to him. I can work a miracle in his or her life. It will not destroy him because he is under authority. You know what Jesus Jesus says? Father, come down. Come down further. When Jesus heard these things, the only place in the Bible the word is used, marvel. He marveled at the faith of the centurions. The other places he was, he marveled at the unbelief of the Jews. Two places the word marvel is used in the Bible. He marveled at the faith of this unbeliever. He said, wow. He got the kingdom concept in a second. He said, wow, he understood it. Well, wasn't that man who should have been really pompous and proud? I'm a centurion. Who are you? The Jews are slaves under you, under us. But he says, no. I understand how authority works. I am also a man under authority. And if you under, work under authority, power will flow unhindered. It will flow unhindered. He understands that principle. And that's what he's talking about over there. And then, many, many, many have settled, settled into those places where you don't demand much faith at all. Many of us, beyond salvation faith and a little beyond that have become comfortable in little rooms. The room in the Bible has got a word for it, it's called Rehoboth. You have been pushed, you have been pushed, you have been pushed, you have been pushed, you have been pushed. Finally you entered into a small room there the enemy leaves you and he says, thank you Lord, thank you for your goodness. God says something much more to you, like now I am comfortable here. I am tired of pushing, don't please push me anymore. In the Bible, the word is called Rehoboth, which means room. 
Many people, their faith stops once they have entered into that little room. And here is a God who says in his Psalms, Ask of me and I shall give you the nations as your inheritance. Does he say? He says. He says. He's still saying the same thing to men and women and young people sitting over here. Ask of me and I shall give you the nations as your inheritance. And how does the enemy push you? Push you through problems in your personal life, in your family life, with your children, with your spouse. Push you, push you, push you. Finally, you will get into a small little room where you have this maneuvering space and you say, Lord, Rehoboth, thank you very much. He's leaving me alone. I can't do anything anymore. God says, do you know just beyond Rehoboth what lies? There is a place with seven wells. It's called Beersheba. That is the place where I want you to be. That is where I want to come and speak to you. In Rehoboth, I don't have anything more to say because you're already comfortable there. Will you move from Rehoboth? There is fullness of God lying a little farther ahead. That's what God is doing with Martha and Mary. These are people who sat at his feet, who have listened to him over and over again. But when they push came to a shop, they said, If you had come, our brother wouldn't have died. If you had come, both of them said the same thing. Looking into the past, they were not looking at the Lord in the present. If you could do in the past, you can do this in the future also. In my present also. And God is looking at us and says, What? What do you think about me now? What do you think about me today? Let's forget yesterday's testimony. What do you think about me today? Am I able? Am I more than able? Do you believe that I can do it? Because walking by faith, look at this statement by a great man of God. Walking by faith means prepared to trust where we are not permitted to see. You and I are not permitted to see into tomorrow. You want us to walk into tomorrow, you have to walk by faith and not by sight. That would mean letting go of everything that you have because you trust the one who has called you. And when you trust your living God that way, it will build an altar. Because real faith, James says, is always translated into works. Because real faith not only loves, but it also builds. It's not enough to say, Lord, Lord, I love you. God says, if you loved me, what did you build? Abraham loved me, so he built an altar. Isaac loved me, therefore he built an altar. Jacob loved me, he built an altar. The Roman centurion in chapter 7 and verse 1 onwards. He loved, he was a centurion, he was a Gentile. What did he do? Comfort. For, yeah, go there, that verse too. For he loves our, who are you? Gentile. Whom are you loving? God's nation. What did he do? He built us a synagogue. If you have loved, God is asking, what did you build? What did you build? What have you built? What have you built? He's asking, what have you built? Does he say in the book of Haggai? Does he say in the book of Haggai? Come to the book of Haggai. Chapter 1, verses 3 to 9. He talks about all of building. He says, the word of the Lord came to Haggai the prophet saying, Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses and this temple to lie in ruins? Now therefore thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways, you have sown much and bring in little. You eat but do not have enough. You drink but you are not filled with drink. You clothe yourself but no one is warm. He who earns wages, earns wages to put into a bag with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways, go up to the mountains and bring wood and build the temple that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified. Which is the temple? The temple is this. This is the temple, the body of Christ. He says, why are you not investing in my people? That's the temple I dwell in now. Why are you so obsessed with your careers? When you stand before me, I'm not going to ask you to show me your resume or your certificates. What about my people? You want a miracle, he says, what about my people? The centurion loved and he built. And Jesus said, your servant shall be well. Have you built? Have you loved? Have you built? I'm not talking about the offering that you put into the bag. That's what belongs to God. You haven't given anything. That's nothing. I'm saying beyond that. Have you invested? Have you invested in the lives of God's people? God's children? The suffering church? The persecuted church? The suffering ones? Churches whom you know with your eyes and your ears you know. Have you? Then how will God send you refreshing in the day of your trouble? Will he go against his own word? He will not go against his own word. He will not go against his word because he has bound himself by his own word. Because he says, if you refresh, I will refresh. 
Otherwise, you will always have to use your card, medical card. John 11 and verse 21 and 32. Sometimes even when we build altars, deep inside there is a voice of resentment, voice of accusation. Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Now you feel, okay, that is Martha, she was busy in the kitchen, so she didn't listen to the word as much as Mary did. Now Mary says, when Mary came down where Jesus was, she saw him and she fell down at her feet, same thing. Two different responses, two different women. One stood before him because she's the worker, she never found time to worship. So she stood and said, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. The other was a worshipper who always sat at his feet. She fell down before him and said, Lord, the same words, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. The words did not change. The attitude, the submission was different. The word in their heart was still the same. Both said the same thing. If a worship is not translated into consecration and surrender, it still is not effective. Still is not effective. It still is not effective. To be effective, it has to surrender, move into surrender of his word and say, Lord, you are able and I believe you. I have no resentment in your heart with what you do with me. If you want, you can raise my brother. But I have no complaints that my brother died because you came late. God is asking, even for surrender saints, he is saying, what is the attitude in your heart when you cry out to me? How do you build your, how do you build your altar? Are you saying that you are not on time? Then verse 38 says, Jesus came to the tomb. This is interesting. What does it say? Jesus came to the Jesus came to the tomb. Why? He's a very busy man. He's a very, very busy man. Why does he come to the tomb? Because he wants to see by your faith what have you built. He always likes to see what have you built. The problem with Mary and Martha is they have built a tomb. He wants to know whether you built a house, a concrete house, an apartment, or whether you built a tent. Did you know in the Bible all the big people, the great men and women of faith only built tents? They never built houses even though houses were there. Did Abraham build a house? I am not saying that go and now start making tents. Okay, Please understand, they will kick you off the road. Okay, What I am saying is that understand the principle. The great men of God in the Bible, they never built houses, they built tents. Tents. Because the house is a concrete structure, it cannot be moved. And it becomes a tomb. And many of you have built the houses which are concrete structures. If God has to meet me, He has to meet at my convenience. I am not going to move. My schedule is too busy. Jesus when? Let me see. I'm sorry. Maybe Saturday afternoon after 8 I may be free. We have built structures of stone. We have not made tents saying, Lord, you want me to be there on a Wednesday? Fine, I am building a tent anyway. I can roll it up and come to you on a, tre- on a Wednesday. You want me to come on a third Saturday? I am here. I am rolling up my tent. I will come. But I have a house. My schedule is fixed. I can't move. I will not move. That's why Jesus wanted to see what had they built. Where had they kept. He came to the tomb. And when he came to the tomb, he was groaning. Why is he groaning? Doesn't he know what he's going to do? Why is he groaning? Because he's doing at the whole fallacy of human effort from beginning till today. You're building structures which will all be destroyed one day when the fire falls. Structures where I did not have any part to play. Where you may catch me out at the outer limits. Outer limits. You catch me on the outer limits saying, saying, God, this much and not any far. Don't make me uncomfortable, please. I want to be comfortable. I want to be comfortable. Please don't make me uncomfortable. I will like Rehoboth, don't call me to Beersheba, because Beersheba demands an altar. It demands an altar. You need to realize that there are people who have built tents, signifying in our lives, in our lives, in this world, this world doesn't matter. We are at your disposable Lord. You can come and disrupt our lives, Lord, and you are never an intrusion into our lives. You are not an intrusion into our lives at all. That's how Lazarus and Mary and Martha lived. You can come anytime to your house, Lord, while you are passing through Bethany. 
21st century, if you pass, pass forward, Jesus and disciples are coming. There goes Lazarus. Mary, what all, Martha, what all should I buy? He's taken his scooter and say, what, where should I go? Chicken legs, drumsticks, vegetables, what is that you want? There is Lazarus shopping, there is Martha busy cooking, and there is Mary keeping, keeping him company. They did not consider Jesus coming into their house and an intrusion into their lives. Therefore, when death intruded into their life, Jesus said, I want to see where it is. I am going to intrude into death today for your sake, because whenever I came, you had a place and a time for me. You didn't put me away. You didn't put me away. You did not put me away. You were there for me. You were there for me. Second World War, the Vietnam War is over, and the soldiers are coming back, and there was this, this young man who came, and he called up his parents. Parents are very well-to-do, socialites, everything, and he calls and he says, Dad, Mom, I am back. And they said, Son, when are you coming? He said, I'm, Can I come today evening? He said, Yes, we have a party, we have a big party, and a lot of guests are coming. He says, Can I bring my friend also? Then he, he said, They said, Yeah, bring your friend. And then he said, but my friend has lost his hands and his feet. He's a cripple. They said, it's okay. You can take him around. But dad, mom, I'm not talking about that. I want to bring him and I want him to stay with us. The parents said, what? That cripple stay with us? And we look after him? They said, that's an intrusion into our lives. Later in the evening, they get a call. The call is from the police saying that in a particular hotel room, we have found a dead body of a cripple and from his identity, it happens to be your son. He's not talking about his friend. He was talking about himself. And the parents said, you are an intrusion into our lives if you don't have arms and feet. God is telling us, people will come into our lives without arms and feet. And I am the one who is coming in them. Do you find them an intrusion into your lives? That is when our faith fails. That is when our faith fails. Lazarus and Mary and Martha, they said, Lord, you are never an intrusion into our lives. So God said, when death intrudes into your life, I will also be there. But there is a problem. The problem is, between a miracle and them, there is a stone. Is the stone. That's the problem. That's this huge stone of unbelief. There's a miracle waiting in your own eyes. What is it? What does she say? Come further down. She will say, The body has been in there for four days. Lord, by this time there is a stench, for he has been dead four days. How do you know? That's a testimony from inside, from behind the stone. They are standing on this side of the stone and already giving a testimony from off that side. Isn't that how most of us say when you are asked to do something, no, what's the, what's the point of doing that? Nothing is going to come out of it anyway. We already seen the testimony on the other side. And God is saying, if you believe, if only you will believe, if only you will believe, what are you going to see? Does he say you will see your brother? Does he say you will see your brother? No, he says you will see the glory of God. You are not going to just see your brother. You are going to see God's glory. You are going to see God's glory. Are you going to see God's glory? No. I have already seen the testimony on that side. It's always thinking, nothing can come out of my life. I am God. I am miserable. Let me take out my best china and my cup and my tea and my teapot and let me have a pity party because everything is over anyway. Because in Rehoboth there is very little room anyway to move. That's how most lives are. But you are not able to believe that he is able and he is more than able. Which we are not willing to dig. We are not able to willing to dig into it. Superficial study of the Bible. Very superficial. God doesn't say that you will drink from the living waters if you scratch at the top. He says you need to build your house on the rock. You need to dig and dig and dig and dig until you hit the rock. And once you have hit the rock, go deeper and deeper. And then when the dry season comes, when the summer comes, the scorching heat comes, the cyclone comes, the storming, storm comes, you will see you are able to draw sustenance from God's rock. Because you have dug deep and dug deep and dug deep. And he says, roll the stone of unbelief away. Roll it away. Roll it away. The one who threw the stars into space, the one who told the storm, be still. Why didn't he say, stone move? Why didn't he say, stone move? Hello, 
Why didn't he say stone move? Because you have to move it. I have to move it. He will not move the stone of unbelief. But if you have believed in the living God and held on to his word and somebody comes and puts a stone over your life, the stone will be removed by your own enemies. Because one day Joseph saw a dream and because of a dream his brothers, his enemies took him and shut him in a well and rolled a stone over it. That's what scripture says, because of his dreams. And then scripture also says they themselves rolled the stone back. Joseph didn't have to roll the stone back because he had believed. Because he had believed. You know that? It's written in the book of Daniel. Because he believed in the word of God more than the edict of the king, he said, I will not change the way I pray. I am going to pray the way I usually always pray. Here I am before the open windows praying. The next thing you see is he is in a den of the lions and the stone has been rolled over it. Next day you see, it is the ones who rolled the stone who comes and rolls the stone back and he is out. He doesn't have to move the stone because he did not operate in unbelief, he operated in faith. Because he believed the one who called him is more than able. You getting it? Are you getting it? And Jesus before he died, he called his eleven disciples and said, tomorrow I am going to die. Early Sunday morning, please come. Don't tell anybody and roll the stone off. Okay, because I need to get out. Did he say that? But scripture says the angels came and rolled the stones off. Stone had the seal and the signature of the greatest power on planet earth, the Roman Empire. It was sealed with soldiers standing on guard. But when the stone had to be rolled, it was rolled. Because when he died, he died in faith by saying, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. I know it will bring it back. No stone can hold me back. No stone can hold me back. And God is asking, what is holding you back this morning from what you are looking for in God? What is holding you back? Where are you tied down? Where are you bound? What have you rolled over your life? The Rehoboth, what have you told? Rolled. We need to understand this difference. The question God is asking is, When you roll away the stone of unbelief, when you roll away the stone of unbelief, when then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you, you have heard me. When Rennie rolls away the stone of unbelief in her heart, Jesus will, the high priest of our salvation, the high priest of our intercession, will stand before Father and say, Father, finally she believes. Oh Lord, I was waiting for this day. Finally she believes. And he will say, what? What you thought dead in your life, what you thought the enemy has taken away, what you thought was stinking and decaying in your life, let it come forth. Alive and well and new. Let it come forth. Let it come out. Why? Because she chose to believe. Chose to believe. And then he says, he who had died, very clear, came out. He came out. He came out. But how did he come out? How did he come out? He came out bound. What is that we call it in English? All these few characters? It's called liberty without freedom. Are you free? Yes. Are you able to do anything? No. Liberty without freedom. You are, you are free. What is stopping you? Neither can you do anything. And God says, Allah yet, yet bound. Many are happy. Spiritually they are not walking at all. They are not walking at all. But they are happy. Why? I am out. Are you walking? No. Have you seen bound men walking? They don't walk. They shuffle. That's how they walk. They shuffle. That's how most believers walk. They walk with God, is shuffling. Where are you, Lord? Three kilometers. Where are you? I'm still here. Why? I'm shuffling. Where are you? How many years have passed by? Where is your purpose? Where is your destiny for which Christ Jesus called you? That's what Paul said, for the purpose for which he called me. Where is that purpose? Where is your destiny? Have you fulfilled one fourth of it? One tenth of it? A portion of it? Where it is? Do you really think he called you and me for just this? Just this? As a father, he loves you whether you do anything or not. Because as a parent, if I have what we call a mentally challenged child, I will love him. I will always love him. 
But I wish always he was not born this way. Will you, wouldn't you, as a parent? Wouldn't you always pray? I wish he wasn't born this way. He's such a strain on me. But because he's born of me, I cannot abandon him. Because I had one uncle like that. Till the day he died, he was taken care of. He was taken care of. Well taken care of. But always, when his parents, my grandparents died, they looked at his elder brother and said, please take care of him. And for him, it was such a drain on his life. Till the last day, he took care of him. Why? He cannot take care of himself. Now God is asking, are you one of that in the church, in the body of Christ? Who needs to be taken care of day after day, week after week, year after year, year after year. Are you that? If God were to look at you spiritually, would he say that you are challenged? Because you are not walking, you are shuffling. Then he says, I called you, equipped you so that you would go and take care of the others. This is how the kingdom works. This is for that. Because there are very few new believers here. Many of us are very old senior believers who have to stand up and take their place in the kingdom of God. And it doesn't come from the pulpit. It happens in your, in your house which you have created. Where there is an altar and where there is a tent. Then you have dug deep into the word of God. You have dug and dug and dug and dug and dug a well. Then you will suddenly realize God is speaking to me my destiny. And when I go to the church on Sunday morning and worship and listen from the pulpit, he's confirming that destiny he has spoken to me. Because God is not a respecter of persons. All our well-to-do parents over here, including me, I am telling you, if he continues the way he is continuing, I am telling you, within less than two years, that boy Alan will play every musical instrument in this house. Our children may not. Our children may not, including mine, because they have too much. But he will. He will play this. He will play that. He will play the violin. He will play everything. Because God is not a respecter of persons or children or parents. He is not moved by our pedigree and our bank balances. He is moved only by the heart of people. Do you really love me? Do you really care for me? Are you willing to put in the effort? I am there with you. I am there with you. I am there with you. Do not look down on those 21 children. 10 years from now, you will be amazed. Where they will be. They have the hand of God upon their lives. Do not look down upon them. They are special. Because they have already started ministering. When they have nothing. They are not like our usual orphans. Which I have seen. When I say no to you visiting you, I will usually say no, not say no to take devotions 30 kilometers away at 9 in the morning for them because they are special. Let my back hurt, it's okay. They are worth it. Are you getting it? Genesis 26 verses 12 to 25. So Abimelech charged all his people... Uh, no, 12, 12, 12. Isaac sowed in that land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. And the man began to prosper and continue prospering until he became very prosperous. <laughs> what kind of a prosperity is that? <laughs> that is too much of prosperity for one man, right? For he had possessions of all flocks and possessions of herds and a great number of servants, so all the Philistines envied him. Today it's different. When God sees there is an anointing, the enemy sees there is an anointing resting upon your life because he knows scripture well even if you do not know. He knows what true riches is. He knows true riches is Ephesians 1.3. He has blessed you with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. When he sees that, the Philistine will envy you. Man, this God anointing over his life. He's spending time praying. He's spending time seeking the face of God. He's getting wisdom and revelation after revelation. I need to hedge him in before he creates trouble. Because they're scared. I said, we'll take over their land. That's what the enemy is scared about. The enemy is not scared about how many jobs, how many salary hikes you get. He's scared whether you will win souls. He's very scared of that because that is his position. And what do they come and tell him? What you will do? Now the Philistines had stopped up all the wells which his father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham his father. And they had filled them with earth. Do you get it? Now don't go by lineage, Abraham and Isaac. You go by spiritual lineage. The enemy who came against Moses will not go against Rehoboam or whatever his son's names are. What are his son's names? Gershom. Gershom. 
The enemy who came against Moses is not going to come against Gershom because he sees no anointing over Gershom. He will come against Joshua. Are you getting it? God doesn't come to Joshua and uh, Gershom and say, as I was with your father, I will be with you. He says, as I was with Moses, Joshua, I will be with you. He knows whose spiritual progeny are, upon whom the anointing rests. So what did, the anointing that was there in the previous generation and through which there was a flood of evangelism and a willing of souls and a building of the body, the enemy will come in the next generation and start filling it up, filling it up, filling it up, pushing you, pushing you. And Abimelech said to Isaac, go away from us, for you are much mightier than we. And then Isaac departed from there and pitched his tent in the valley of Gerar and dwelt there. And Isaac dug again in the wells of water which they had dug in the days of Abraham his father. What did the Philistines do? They came, stopped, he called them by names which his father had called them. And then also Isaac's servants dug in the valley and found a well of running water there. But what happened? The herdsmen of Gerar quarreled with Isaac's herdsmen saying, the water is ours. So he called the name of the well Isaac because they quarreled with him. You see, this man is getting pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed only because the hand of God is upon him. And then they dug another well. And they quarrel over that one also. He called it name Sitna. Then he moved from there and dug another well. They did not quarrel over it. So he called his name. What did he call his name? Oh, finally, Lord, thank you. I got a well. Nobody is quarrel- quarreling over it. Let me stay here, oh Lord. There is water. There is a well. Nobody is fighting over it. He called it. For now, God has made... Many people are satisfied with just that because God has made room for them. Oh, thank you, Lord. I don't want to get into any spiritual warfare, any battle anymore. One room, one well, I am very happy. Thank you very much. But what did he say? Then he went up from there. Yeah. Next one. What? Did he stay stay at the boat? Did he stay? No. What did he do? He went up from there to... God doesn't meet you at Rehoboth. Because you are already satisfied with the things of God at Rehoboth. Why should he meet you there? He meets his people at Beersheba. And then the Lord appeared to him the same night he reached Beersheba. He said, I am the God of your father Abraham. Do not fear for I am with you. I will bless you and multiply your descendants for my servant Abraham's sake. And what did he do? Next verse. So he built an altar there. And then what did he do? Called upon the name of the Lord and he pitched his tent there. And what did Isaac's servants do? They dug a... Did you get the message? Once you have moved from your seat of comfort, you will meet God there. God will meet you there. And then you will have an altar. He will appear to you. You will have an altar. You will pitch your tent and you will dig a well. And you will be sustained. That's the testimony of Isaac. He built an altar, pitched a tent, dug a well. You want to talk about this man? In three words, what it is? An altar, not a house, a tent, and he dug a well. Where did he meet it? He met it at Beersheba. Why did God wait till he reached Beersheba? Because it is at Beersheba his father Abraham had met God and built an altar. So you can't stay at Rehoboth. You need to move to Beersheba. That is what God is trying to tell. Mary and Martha, I love you. I brought you till Rehoboth. But I want to move you further, 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 further with me. Never get satisfied with your life in me. You never get satisfied. There's much more than you see. Much more than you can think or hear about. Move from Rehoboth because many, many have got stuck at Rehoboth. Are you getting the message? We have communion. It's only 11.30. The messages may grow longer or shorter in the days to come. Don't worry. If you are at Rehoboth, you will leave. If you are in Beersheba, you will stay. I have been called to build a Beersheba, not a Rehoboth. So now as we go to communion, to the Lord's table. I would like the brothers who helped to come and the worship team to come. And we ask ourselves this morning, is there a stone of unbelief that I need to roll away? Is there a stone of unbelief that I need to roll away? If I have rolled that stone away, If I have rolled that stone away, are there still... Am I still bound? Am I still bound? Am I still bound? As you come... Father, even as we stand here in your presence, we thank you, Father. When we look into our tomorrows, Father, we see 
You see only another 45 days to go before the year is over. But you brought us through this year of God. We stand here because of your faithfulness and your goodness and your mercy and your love towards each one of us. You sustained us, O God, with your right hand. You held us up. As you told the children of Israel, you carried us on eagles' wings and brought us thus far. It's not by our strength or by our ability or anything, O God, that we are here. It's by your grace and your grace alone. Otherwise, you would have been consumed before our time. And there would have been no one standing outside our tombs to call us out. But you saw that each one of us were fit to live in the land of the living. And today, once again, O oh God, we come to you. And we say, Lord, we want to build an altar. We want to pitch a tent and dig a well. Each one of us, end of the day, end of time, our testimony of Father should be that we had an altar before you every day of our life. And we did not build anything in this earth that was after our own name. We lived as pilgrims and strangers, as aliens in this world, looking forward to a better home and a better place. And every day we had, we dug deep and deep into that word which we knew alone could sustain us. Because you are the one who said to the enemy of mankind, that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And today, as we go back home, I pray for the grace of God, the power of the Holy Spirit will overshadow us and enable us to keep the word that we have heard. Because we are weak. But you are strong. And you are able, more than able, to do it through us. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Heal those who are hurt. Bind their wounds. Those who are struggling, you bear their strength. You be their provision. You be their portion. You be their healing. You know, you know, Lord, whom I am talking about, the ones in this church who grieve day and night. So many, so many, so many. When they look into their tomorrows, they see nothing. But a Father, I pray today, eyes of faith will open. That they will see the risen Son of God rising, rising. The Son of righteous, Righteousness rising over their lives with healing under His wings, O oh God. And the ones who are crippled and bound, O oh Father, let them go out like calves released from their stalls. Because they know the hand of the living God is upon them. Let them not be bound anymore, O oh God. Let them not be bound. Let them not consider themselves as orphans and widows. Let them know they have a father in heaven and a husband in Christ who will never leave them nor forsake them. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Thank you. We praise you. We worship you. We give you the glory. Give you the glory. You alone deserve the glory. For in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with each one of us. Amen.